Yep. Yes, we can. Okay, great. We are very happy to welcome Navina uh, Haider today. She is the curator in charge of the Department of Islamic Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Navina helped lead the planning of the museum's galleries for the art of the Arab lands, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and later South Asia, which together have welcomed more than 3 million visitors since the galleries opened in November of 2011. Navina is a 1984 graduate of the prestigious Lawrence School Sennar. After a childhood spent traveling the world as the daughter of a diplomat, Navina did her PhD in Islamic art from Oxford University. After a stint at Christie's, she took up her position with the Metropolitan Museum, and she now lives in New York City with her professor husband, Dr. Bernard Haeckel, and their two children. Welcome, Navina. Thank you so much, uh, Romy and Ranjit and everybody here. It's a real pleasure for me to be speaking uh, to such a distinguished uh, gathering and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share my some of the work that I've been doing. Um, it's also, I just want to say some special words of appreciation for the opening remarks of John Barringer. Those were very inspiring, very moving. So thank you so much for sharing those thoughts and those words. Um, it's really great to see everyone here. I actually also see that uh, Keshav Mittal is in the, in the crowd somewhere. And I just want to mention that Keshav's father um, was a great personal inspiration to me when I was a younger student. He used to he had, a, he, he had a great love and knowledge of Mughal and Indian art, and, and we had many important conversations together, and he was a great uh, sort of um, icon in our family. So it's great to see Keshav here, and I'd love to, and I'm remembering his father this time. So um, my talk today is about the Mughal period in India, and I will be uh, approaching it through just 10 objects, um, which will give you a sense of the treasures, uh, the things the Mughals treasured and the things that we treasure today about the Mughals. So, um, but before I get started, I'm just not sure how many of you are familiar with this particular phase of Indian history, world history. So I'll just say a few words about who the Mughals were. The word Mughal is actually a, a corruption of the word Mongol because the ancestry of this ruling family of Northern India uh, goes back to the Mongols of, uh, well, of Mongolia, ultimately, uh, who were a, a sort of moving force that uh, spread across from as early as the 13th century into the Middle East, where they established themselves. They came as sort of Buddhists and animists, but they eventually became Muslims and established the Ilkhan dynasty in Iran, the Ilkhanid dynasty. And from there, there was a kind of fertile uh, culture that evolved where the Mongols were now Muslims. They were patrons of art and architecture and history. And some very important things happened under the Mongol patronage in Iran. For example, the idea of a world history, the concept of the history of the whole world <clears throat> is, a, is an idea text that was produced in their court, the Jamil Tawarikh. Um, so they innovated many things. And then <clears throat> a branch of this uh, sort of grand family uh, became the Timurids, who were based in eastern part of Iran and, and Afghanistan. And then a further branch of that family came into India, the founder of the founding the, the Mughal dynasty in India, and that happened in 1526. So that's roughly the period when the Mughal period starts in India, is considered to have started or founded in India, and it lasted almost 300 years um, until the British conquered India. Uh, and so from 1526, for a period of 300 years, you had the Mughals very powerful in the, in the 16th and the 17th century, but through the 18th and the 19th century, things were changing, their fortunes changed. And by the 19th century, they were more or less you know, eliminated and in, in the Indian subcontinent came into um, British rule into the British Raj. What the Mughals left for the British to take essentially was a, a vast and complex and diverse empire that stretched all the way from Afghanistan, from the borders of Afghanistan to the borders of Burma 
in the east and right down to the south, almost encompassing all of what we see as the Indian subcontinent today. Um, this was much larger actually than what you see as a map of India today because when the British left, they divided that huge mass into three countries. Uh, well, two initially and then three, uh, Pakistan, India and um, Bangladesh. And in some ways, the legacy that, that was left behind after partition and maybe before it is, is a very, quite a difficult one um, where these societies are all kind of dealing with, uh, you know, identity issues. Um, and, and unfortunately, the Mughal period is very much part of the, uh, you know, problem for some people and, and it's being very much undermined and, and attacked. So I'm a great believer that you go away from the politics and you get to the achievements, to the beauty, to the <clears throat> excitement. And everything usually bad fades away because human beings generally prefer a wonderful option to a negative one. So I hope in 10 objects to be able to show how exciting the Mughal period was and what great treasures they had for us to enjoy today and for us to be able to appreciate them today. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, and I hope this works, let's just. Okay, um, can, you, can you see? Uh, we can see a blank screen, but we can see it says started screen sharing. Oh. Double click to enter full screen. Uh, I was sharing it before, so let me try again. Does this, does this look good? Can you see this? No, it's still there. Oh, now, there yes, now it works. Now you can see, okay. So you can hear me all right, you can see the screen. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, let's dive into our Mughal world. Um, now, the reason we're looking at the treasures is because the Mughals were fabulously wealthy. They had great taste and they maintained a very glamorous court culture, which was very cosmopolitan with influences from everywhere. And it was really hard to choose just 10 sort of objects to talk about. But I tried to do it going through, this, through the patronage of the most important figures. Um, and that starts with Akbar. Uh, and Akbar is the, uh, the grandson of the founder. So you had Babur who founded the empire. Uh, excuse me one second. Um, Okay, so you had um, so you had Babur who founded the empire, Homayu who was his son, and then the grandson uh, was Akbar, and he really established the parameters of the empire. He conquered tremendous territory. He really built up the center, and he also, uh, for thirty years of his rule, uh, had all kinds of extraordinary art and architecture produced for him. Um, and from one of the things that was what happened in the Akbar period was that the foundation of the Mughal school of painting, which is a very distinguished school of painting, was founded. And one of the early treasures in Akbar's uh, library was called the Hamza Nama. So, so my first object is the Hamza Nama. Now the Hamza Nama is the illustrated history of the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad. His uncle's name was Amir Hamza. And uh, this character of history had all kinds of extraordinary adventures. He was a great defender of the religion of Islam. And, um, and this text or the story of, the, of Hamza was not very often illustrated. It was a kind of a popular tale that was often um, sort of sung and recited, but you know, illustrated manuscripts of it were not that well known. So Akbar's painters in about 1570, very ambitiously combination of Persian painters to Iranian painters who'd come from the court of Shah Tahmasp in under the reign of Akbar's father, <clears throat> Mir Sayyid Ali and Abdul Samad, joined together with the local talents, many of whom were from the state of Gujarat, and together, these, these artists founded a new way of painting and a new stylistic expression. And one of the first projects they did was to come up with the illustrated adventures of Amir Hamza. Now, keep in mind, they had no models to look at. They had to come up with all the iconography themselves. They had to invent um, images for, uh, for each episode. So here you see uh, that the uh, Amir Hamza, the Prophet's uncle's son, has been kidnapped. 
and, uh, and some people decide to come to the rescue. Uh, you have Misbah on the right, this large figure here, and Paran on the left as they plot to rescue the kidnapped son. And this, the painting itself is almost two feet, um, two feet large, so it's a very large painting. Dis very distinctly uh, and you know, special to the Indian tradition is the fact that it was painted on cloth. And when you begin to look closely at the painting, you see the absolute delights of this new style that, were, that was unfolding. You see these figures that are extremely large and expressive and, and the sort of vitality of these figures that that's, comes across. You begin to see fascinating compositions. For example, look at all those bows and arrows and shields and swords that are all arranged almost like a still life composition against the wall. You're sort of beginning to see the idea that, each, that, this, that the larger composition is made up of smaller vignettes. Um, you can even recognize the skins on the, on the wall below. That's a lion skin and that's a tiger skin, which you can see. Uh, and there are lots of interesting details. In fact, this figure is wearing draped a tiger skin around him too. Now, um, here you have a scene of the, of the attendants who are sitting on a, flower, a flowered carpet. You have objects that are being offered to them, uh, food um, and wonderful patterns all over. Uh, and again, the sense of liveliness and communication and action that you see in this painting is all very new and innovative and represents the kind of rise of a kind of new aesthetic language in the Mughal period. Um, <clears throat> I should also mention that, you know, unlike European art and, and other forms of art, but mainly European, the survival of objects from Indian art and, and Mughal, early Mughal period is very rare. So often we depend upon the depiction of objects in paintings to be able to know what objects would have been like. So for example, we don't really have any bottles of that type that survive from the Mughal, from this particular period. We don't have porcelain vessels with covered lids, but you can see that that is blue and white porcelain, which is an import from China. And you can see that there are metalwork covers that went, went over those, those, those dishes to serve the food. So the kind of um, information, the historical information you can get from the detailed um, des descriptions in these paintings of the Akbar period are really a, a key to history of that period. And that's one of the reasons that we treasure them to today apart from their aesthetic value. And they were treasured in their time because of um, you know, the innovation and the importance of the book arts and importance of, of the painted works that, that were great value in the period. So that's treasure number one from the period of Akbar. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about the second treasure, which is a royal spinel with inscriptions. Now a spinel, it looks like a ruby, but it's in fact a different kind of a gemstone. Um, it has got a beautiful dark red ruby color, and, but it's, it's found actually in a region of Afghanistan called Badakhshan. And <clears throat> these, these gemstones come in very large sizes. They were collected by the Mughals and they were inscribed in wheel cut inscriptions, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, with the titles of the Mughals, because they were used as kind of um, uh, sort of emblems of, of uh, you know, distinction and emblems of dynastic legitimacy. That's why you had the names and titles inscribed on these gems. They, uh, they, in terms of their composition, they're more like sapphire than, ru than ru what we think of as a ruby today. Um, and the reason the Mughals especially love them is because of the region they come from, Badakhshan, was close to their ancestral homelands in, in the Timurid world. And so Jahangir, the, second, uh, the fourth Mughal emperor, the son of Akbar, particularly loved these. And here we have one of the most famous Balas rubies. They're known also as Balas rubies in the world. And it's, it's, um, here it is on the left-hand side. And I should mention that this is now in a private collection in Kuwait. Uh, a, a very distinguished collection known as the Al Sabah collection. It's a royal collection of Kuwait and the Kuwait royal family. Now, immediately you can see that it looks like a like an incredible glowing 
purplish reddish almost egg um, the weight of this the gemstone is 249.31 carats which is very substantial i've actually held it in my hand we, we had it on exhibition at the met it really is an incredible thing i mean it has a uh, beautiful weight and feel and then you can see that all on the surface are these incredible inscriptions everything that you see here is a wheel cut inscription now to inscribe these titles which by the way the writing goes from right to left and for those of you who can make out a, the word shah for example there are there are lots of uh, titles that you can basically make out some go in this direction some go in that direction and i'm going to tell you what they all are but to tell you how extraordinary the um the technique is you would have to have carved the inscriptions um, with a diamond tipped stylus or a wheel that had a that that was somehow edged with, with and spinning very fast and was somehow edged with a diamond or another hard edge that could cut into this stone and that spinning wheel would have been under slurry so to make to make the cut and to make you would have had to you couldn't even see the surface of what you were doing because you had to have this thing called slurry in between which facilitates the the actual grinding and the cutting so it's an incredible technique and the fact that you've got this over several um actually centuries shows you how good the the, the techniques of handling gemstones at this period was now what's special about this gem apart from its physical attributes is its history it's got the first inscription it contains is from the Timurid ruler, the ancestral ruler of the Mughals named Uluk Beg, And that inscription is probably before 1449. Uluk Beg was a fascinating character of history. He was a great astronomer and the remnants of his uh, astronomical um, edifice is remains in Uzbekistan today. Um, and you can visit it. There's, but he actually, you know, advanced modern um, science quite a lot with his uh, commitments. The gemstone then later fell into the hands of the Iranian ruler Shah Abbas I because we have an inscription on the surface and a date of Shah Abbas in the date of 1617. We then know from Jahangir's own memoirs, the Jahangir Nama, that he received this gemstone and he had it inscribed in 1621. So now the gemstone has moved from Uzbekistan to Iran to India. Now from Jahangir, it goes to his son Shah Jahan who is the builder of the Taj Mahal. Taj Shah Jahan's son, Aurangzeb, <coughs> then received this gem and inscribed his title on it and the date of 1659 to 60, which is when he would have just won the war of succession against his brother Dara Shuko. And then after that, there are two, uh, there's a further ruler uh, inscription, which is the last one, which is from the ruler of Afghanistan, um, who seized this gemstone and took it away in the 18th century. And now it's, it's in Kuwait. So it's amazing that we can trace this gemstone through history. In the Jahangir Nam, I mentioned that, that uh, Jahangir mentioned it. So here's his statement about it. He says that he, because it had his ancestors inscription on it, he inscribed his own name on it and, and took it as a granting of God's grace on him. He treasured it so much. He, how did he get it from Shah Abbas? He had actually sent um, an ambassadorship to Iran. And along, and in this ambassadorship, in this group was an artist called Bishindas, who actually portrayed Shah Jahan. You see him, uh, Shah Abbas. You see Shah Abbas here on the right in this drawing, made by Bishindas. And here on the left, when Bishindas came back, further pictures were made of Shah Abbas with Jahangir. So Jahangir is on the right and Shah Abbas is on the left. If you notice a subtle or not so subtle way in which Jahangir is bigger than Shah Abbas, Jahangir stands on the lion while Shah Abbas stands on the lowly goat. And Jahangir is slightly pushing him off his lands while he kind of dominates the geography of the globe. Um, that kind of tells you the, the politics and the ambitions at the time. And this stone was wrested from Shah, Jahan, from Shah Abbas and given to Jahangir. Jahangir then, you see Jahangir here, hands this gemstone in this painting to his son, the future Shah Jahan, who is at this point known as Khurram, um, I mean his princely name. And he had just done a very good thing, which is he'd conquered part of the Deccan region. So, Shah Jah so Jahangir was very pleased with him and handed over the gemstone to him, which you see in the, in the folio from the Padshah Nama. Shah Jahan then became the king of the Mughal Empire, the ruler of the Mughal Empire. 
And one of the most spectacular treasures that was built for Shah Jahan is the famous peacock throne, which is now no longer exists, but you will have seen novels by the name, the peacock throne, etc. It's one of the most romantic ideas of the Mughals, along with the Taj and other things. Now, there's several depictions of the peacock throne. Um, this one that I'm showing you is considered by most scholars to be closest to what the peacock throne probably actually looked like, which was a, a, a jeweled pedestal, which you approach through jeweled steps, four jeweled uh, columns covered with rubies and, and diamonds and emeralds, surmounted by a golden canopy, surmounted by two enameled peacocks, those round things that you see actually peacocks with open feathers. And into this incredibly jewel encrusted um, uh, piece of you know, architecture was the, that ruby, that spinel was embedded in this. Later on, it gets inherited by the austere or so-called austere Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb had a very long reign. Um, he's, a, he's a sixth Mughal emperor. He ruled throughout the second half of the 17th century. And he's being, you know, much vilified today. He was a very complex figure. He also inherited this gem. And he, you see him here with, um, with his, uh, in the Deccan, which he sought to further conquer. And then later on, these are the two sort of later characters who later inherited the gemstone. Um, now I'll end the story of this gemstone by saying that the Queen of England thinks she has this gemstone because in, um, in the royal treasures in, the, in, in Windsor Castle, there is a, there's a beautiful spinel necklace with also an inscription here, which belongs to Her Majesty. And it's known as the Timor Ruby set in a, in a, in a necklace. But in fact, this is not the Timor ruby because this particular gem is not the one we're talking about. It does not have the inscriptions dating back to Uluk Beg. The one that ha has the inscriptions dating back to Uluk Beg and is the one that is cited in all the um, sources is the one that I've shown you that's now in Kuwait. So anyway, um, goes to show that the rivalry between royals to own precious gems still continues in our modern times. Okay, so treasure number three is an incredible thing because it comes from another universe practically altogether possibly. And that is a dagger that was made for the fourth Mughal emperor, but it was made out of meteor. Um, <clears throat> now, what happened is that in 1621, in the district of Jalandhar, which is in Punjab, a a meteor actually hit planet Earth and it hit planet Earth in Jalanda. And again, Jahangir, the fourth Mughal emperor, he wrote about it in his memoirs. He says, at dawn, a tremendous noise arose in the east. It was so terrifying that it nearly frightened the inhabitants out of their skin. Then in the midst of the tumultuous noise, something bright fell to the earth from above. I ordered it to be weighed in my presence and it weighed 160 tolas. So he, he, he actually, there's more in the description that I didn't put in. I mean, he actually describes how hot the ground was and how burnt up the earth was, how difficult it was for his people to excavate it and get it out. Anyway, then he orders his master Daud, the craftsman, to make a sword, a dagger, and a knife out of it and to show them. And he couldn't make it out of the entire meteor because the substance wasn't man easy to manipulate. So he mixed it with another type of iron and produce two swords and a dagger. Now, <clears throat> all these objects are mentioned in the Jahangir Nama, they're all lost to history, except one, which is in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And that is one of the daggers. So this dagger that you're looking at, the blade, which looks so rough, and you can see how difficult and like how veined it is and how hard it looks, this actually is the meteor blade because the blade was meteor and the hilt was made of you know regular materials the gold piece that you see here is the inlaid royal umbrella which was a symbol of mughal royalty and they often had that inlaid into the blades um, so that's what you see there if you turn the dagger to the side along the hilt is a and there's a little inscription in persian a narrow inscription in persian um, which actually was composed by uh, a figure at court who we know, very important figure na named Saida Gilani, who was a craftsman who came from Iran and was very, very good at writing. And he was 
multifaceted talent. So you can see that he's, his composition is actually in here, a little poem that he wrote about this um, and mentions this particular dagger So it's and dated it. So it's an incredible piece of history and science and a great treasure for us and for the Mughals today. Uh, I mean, for the Mughals in their time. So in, uh, treasure number four is a lot of fun because as you can probably tell from this story of the dagger, uh, Jahangir, the fourth Mughal emperor was very interested in natural occurrences and in nature. And so among the things that he was doing was also collecting exotic animals and recording them in paintings. So uh, one of the paintings from his period actually shows an animal that became extinct in 1687. And this is the famous dodo bird. Um, the dodo bird, so you can imagine that the, if the dodo bird has been extinct since 1687, it's never been captured in photography. And if it was captured in a painting based on observation, which it was in the Mughal court, that goes to show how important this, this visual record was. But before I introduce you to the dodo bird, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of other wonderful beasts who came into Jahangir's world. And that is um, because they're all delightful and there's sort of a nice uh, pathway to, uh, to, the, to the dodo bird. So um, as background, in, six, uh, in 1612, um, a, he, Jahangir had sent his servant to one of his high-ranking courtiers named Mukarrab Khan to buy rarities from the Portuguese who had established a colony in Goa. As you know, they conquered Goa in, 16, uh, in 1510. From 1510, they were in Goa. And in 1612, an, a consignment of animals and birds arrived at this court. And among them was possibly this chameleon. This is an African chameleon. Um, it's a very specific, and, and, and zoologists today have observed this particular painting. It is in the collection of the Queen of England. It is in Windsor Castle. I don't know if my parents who are here today remember we saw it a couple of years ago when it was on display in, in a special exhibition there. Um, but you can see this delightful chameleon has been so well observed that zoologists today say that it's a very useful and accurate de depiction of, the, of this creature. But it's also very artistic, the way the tail curls round and this little butterfly and the way it's composed on the branch. So it's really science meets art. Also at this, through Goa, came this incredible creature, he, a, a zebra from Africa. And when he arrived, uh, I mean, a lot of the people at the court were convinced that this was a horse who had been painted with black and white stripes. And Jahangir, who was a very keen observer of animals, as I mentioned, actually looked at the stripes and made the observation, made a useful comparison between the layout of the stripes on the zebra and the layout of the stripes on a tiger. And he talks about the comparative and actually, again, zoologists have said that his points were very good. And actually he notices that there is some um, similarity to the stripes on both of these animals. So the zebra also arrived. So now you're getting a sense of who, who the, the kind of um, exotic cast of characters. Here's one that came all the way, it seems from North America. It's a North American turkey cock. Um, and he, uh, I mean, tells you something about the extraordinary global trade at this time. Um, Jahangir's description of the peak of this turkey cock is on the screen on the right. But it's quite funny um, how he describes it, uh, you know, different colors um, and how it behaves when it's in heat and it constantly changes colors like a chameleon. So these were some of the exotic rarities. And then along with these, uh, Peter Mundy, who was a visitor at the court, an Englishman tells us that he'd seen uh, two dodo birds at a court, at a, at a center near, near Goa called Surat, not too far from Goa. And he describes them as a strange kind of fowl, twice as big as a goose that can neither fly nor swim, being cloven footed. And he was surprised to see how they came there. And we believe that one of the two dodos that he saw in Surat was then sent to the Mughal court and voila, here is this extraordinary 
painting of the dodo bird who's right in the middle. And this is very rare. Like I said, the dodo bird has been extinct since 1687. Um, it comes from the Mauritius originally. So um, in this painting, you see that the dodo bird occupies the middle ground. And as you can see from Peter Mundy's description, the dodo bird is a flightless bird. It cannot fly, which is why it was um, made extinct by your, mainly European travelers who were arriving at, you know, seafarers at this time. And um, here on, in the same painting, you have a horned pheasant up in the right and a kind of a parrot-like bird uh, on a stand, a lorikeet. And down here, you have ducks, ducks down here and partridges. But the dodo bird is clearly the star of this piece. Um, if you look at, uh, sorry, extinct since 1681. Now, if you look at the dodo bird, um, here on the right-hand side, I found a, a skeleton of a dodo, which is actually reconstructed with parts of more than one dodo, but it's in the Smithsonian Museum, and it's a very useful record of what a dodo bird, uh, you know, you know, it's about two, three feet tall. It's a big bird. It's in what they would have looked like. Uh, I mean, how, how you can relate the painting to at least a surviving skeleton, skeletal structure and see how good, you know, useful it is. So that's the dodo bird. Now, um, I'm now going to introduce the jade ewer of Uluk Beg. So as I mentioned, Uluk Beg had given us that gemstone, given the Mughals a gemstone. They also wanted, other, they loved anything that belonged to Uluk Beg, especially Jahangir. And so it gave him great happiness when he was able to get in his collection this amazing, beautiful nephrite jade ewer, which was made for Uluk Beg. Uh, it was made <clears throat> sometime in the before 1449. And uh, nephrite jade is a material that comes from Chinese Central Asia and it comes in shades from white to sort of dark green and black. And it's very hard material to carve. And you can see that here, you, they've actually uh, made this beautiful ewer with a Chinese style dragon handle. And also um, this ewer has inscriptions on it. The inscription around the neck here is from the period of Uluk Beg. And it says, it praises him and says that his kingship and authority should be eternal. And then round the neck here, you see inscribed another inscription, which was done later on in Jahangir's court by Saida Gilani, the same person who inscribed the gemstone that I showed you. And here it says, uh, praises him and says that he is, his, uh, his uh, reign should also continue on. Um, so what that tells us is that these are not just material objects to be used for functional purposes, but because of uh, the, their prestige, these are objects upon which dynastic authority and ambition is inscribed, literally inscribed. Uh, what's so special about um, nephrite jade? Well, apart from its physical beauty, people at that time also believed, some of them, that it is the frozen sperm of dragons. So now uh, the next treasure I'm going to talk about are the dream paintings of Jahangir, just one dream painting. And here you see Jahangir um, on the globe, which is on an ox, which rests on a fish. And he's shooting arrows into the head of his enemy, uh, whose head is impaled on a tall staff. And um, there are symbols all around him. Uh, of you know divine intervention. There are cherubs in the sky who hand him these divine arrows and there are owls, including a dead owl. I'm gonna show you details in a minute. And all of this Elizabethan kind of uh, allegory that he, he uses in order to uh, sort of state his own position. Now, the person who he's attacking in this picture is a general named Malik Ambar, who is, who is down in the south, southern part of India. He was in fact an Abyssinian, an Ethiopian general and this entire scene that you see here never happened except in Jahangir's dream. Jahangir was desperate to take over that part of India, but it was being defended by the brilliant Malik Ambar. So Jahangir had a dream that he conquered Malik Ambar, but in fact he didn't. Malik Ambar uh, resisted him for 26 years 
and Jahangir was so desperate that he wanted like such a uh, um, you know desire to see something change that he was dreaming that that he had conquered Marikamba, but he hadn't. So his artist Abul Hassan has created this dream vision. Here's Jahangir who's pursing up his lips, trying hard to release the arrow. The arrow goes into the head of uh, Malik. Ambar who's impaled and there are all these symbols of the dark, uh, uh, you know, da darkness because of the owls. That is because Malik Ambar actually is the inventor of what we call guerrilla warfare today. He learned how to succeed against the Mughal Empire's huge army by fighting them in small forces at night. So that is why he was sort of associated with night uh, sort of activities. There are all these symbols and inscriptions, including these that, that show the sort of Elizabethan concept of standing on the world and conquering it. And here you have sort of Islamic concepts of the, what, how the world is organized. It rests on the back of a bull, which rests on a fish, which swims in the cosmic ocean. And that also alludes to Hindu ideas about creation. So it's a very multi-layered kind of imagery speaking to some people, uh, you know, trying to allude to his authority on every possible level. Um, and then here are the scales of justice that you see also included in this painting and a series of bells. So if anybody is unfairly treated in Jahangir's kingdom, you can ring the bells and you will have the attention of the ruler who will bring justice to you. But of course, that's all just a dream. So, and the dream persists till today <laughs> um, in most rulers' uh, imagination. So now I'm going to go to uh, the next treasure, which is an extraordinary diamond known as the Shah Jahan diamond. Um, and Shah Jahan, the son of Jahangir, is, uh, was one of the great connoisseurs of gemstones in the world. He really understood gemstones. He loved them. He built the Taj Mahal. I mean, he was an incredible figure when it came to his vision. I mean, very few people in the world have matched Shah Jahan's vision for beauty for uh, doing something unbelievable and the creation of the Taj Mahal is one of them. It's really very sad today that this building that should be treasured around the world and it is treasured around the world is being demeaned in the way that it is by you know the local authorities who want to change its character have undermined and, and I read only yesterday uh, I was just told that there was some article right now about how its name might be changed and so on. So we have to prepare ourselves almost to say goodbye to one of the great treasures of, of Mughal India, of the world. Um, and this is a sad state of affairs. But here you have Shah Jahan in a portrait, in a, yeah, as a, as a, and he, he writes in his own handwriting down there. He says, a good likeness of me in my 25th year. Um, so he's 25 years old in this painting, and he's holding in his hand a, a turban ornament, which is a sort of European form, like a slightly like an aigrette. Um, and there are various inscriptions telling you about the painter. And if you look at this aigrette though, you see that there's a green stone up on top, which is probably an emerald, a South American emerald, because of course the emeralds were coming from Colombia. And down below was the local product because the diamonds were all from the Deccan region of India. And that diamond that you see has this elongated shape and is almost like a flat pane of glass, we think might be this incredible diamond, which survives, is also in the Al-Sabah collection in Kuwait, because that is one of the most serious collections of Mughal gems. Um, and this gemstone is 56.7 carats, and you can see it's beautifully faceted, just this irregular um, asymmetrical faceting. And it's actually got this little extension up here. So what you can do is take a silk thread and string it through the actual diamond itself without any mounts whatsoever and just wear it around your neck, just the pure diamond around your neck. And the shape of it is that of a taviz or an auspicious amulet in, in, in India and, and in the Muslim world. Now comes one of the most beautiful objects ever made for Shah Jahan. And this was his wine cup. It is really one of the most extraordinary objects you'll see in the world, and also made of nephrite jade. And I don't even need to say very much about it except to show you the pictures because it's so stunning. You see, it is, um, this is the underside of the, of the piece. 
this is this is the actual cup this is how you would have had wine probably rice wine in here and here is a view of it from the underside you can see the beautiful sculptural qualities of it uh, it's a masterpiece of jade carving it's a masterpiece of artistic composition and it's in the vna um, and that's what Shah Jahan drank his wine out of. He also had a cameo made for him. And that's a beautiful thing too. I consider that a treasure of the Mughals. Uh, here you see Shah Jahan. He's now a slightly older man. You can literally see how he's aged from the age of 25. He must be about 45 here. Um, he's grown a beard. And the detail is just incredible in this cameo. Um, it's so much based on a painting. Um, it's surrounded, of course, by a row of rubies. And a cameo, let me remind you, is like a carnelian or an agate that's banded with two colors. So an artist or craftsman has to cut it away in such a way that one color sits on top of another color, creating the image, which is what you have here. There are some other cameos of Shah Jahan known, um, but that one that I showed you is considered the number one and most important one. And then the last treasure that I'm showing you is from Aurangzeb's period, which is Aurangzeb's coronation. And poor Aurangzeb has been much vilified, as I said. He's a convenient target today for people who wish to um, essentialize and uh, you know, misrepresent a very complex character of history and a very complex period of Indian history. Um, Aurangzeb ruled for the entire second half of the 17th century. Um, and in order to um, succeed, uh, you know, the first challenge he had was to grab the throne from his brother Dara Shuko, who was the uh, anointed heir apparent. So the Battle of Succession of 1658 is a great sort of event in Mughal history where Aurangzeb succeeded in killing his brother. By the way, in this period, everybody killed their brothers and fathers. Uh, fratricide and patricide were the general norm of the day. And the people that you trusted least were your own family. The whole idea of a family who you love and trust was not the Mughal model. And in fact, was not the medieval model or the early modern model almost anywhere in the world. Because power was what it was all about. And the greatest rivals to power were other people in the family. So um, there was always tremendous uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, conflict in families. Now, when Aurangzeb uh, defeated his brother, it wasn't just one event. I mean, there were several important battles that took place and the whole period of his taking over was almost a full year. After a very important, from 1658 to 1659. So he had one sort of informal coronation in 1658 when he first succeeded, and then a very grand coronation in 1659 when he completed his succession. Um, the first coronation was a very simple affair. And this is an amazing painting that actually records that event. Um, you see, it, he, he was actually took the coronation, the first coronation in Delhi, in, in a part of Delhi that is probably no longer exists. Um, it's a garden, uh, I'll give you the name, uh, which had some fine imperial buildings. And you can see that in the background, there's a sort of garden setting that's a Persian water wheel and he's outside um, outside a building. The gardens in the Mughal period often had terraces and had um, small structures and pavilions in them. But the interesting thing here is you have Aurangzeb with two uh, princes and very simple moment. There's no grandeur, there's no great court around him like some of the other pictures I showed you. But the skies have opened up and a divine beam of light radiates down on Aurangzeb, giving him that authority. And that idea of a divine beam of light comes from European painting and European art. Because for example, here you have St. Francis shown in 1622 in a print. Um, and you can see that the heavens have opened up. It's an apotheosis concept and a divine beam of light comes down and bestows uh, God's divinity upon this particular figure. So it is a very um, interesting use of a European uh, allegory. Um, and here is the setting. The, se the setting, I don't know if people here know the you know, geography of Delhi, but it's a, it's a garden setting, which might be a place called Agharabad and later called Shalimar Bagh, which is in eight miles northwest of Delhi. Um, so that's the last Mughal treasure that I end with. And I hope I, hope I haven't taken too much of your time. And thank you so much.
No, no. Thank you, Navina. That's been really interesting. Now we'll take, uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. So if any of you have a question, please go ahead and unmute yourself and, uh, and, and ask your question. All right. Is, Keshav, did you? Uh, hey, Ranjit, I have a question. If, if I may. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. This was amazing. I, I learned so much. I do have, uh, actually, if you don't mind, two questions. First, um, it, you mentioned that there were no artifacts present um, uh, to, in one of the earlier pictures uh, where you depicted the, 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 uh, the, the serving dish with the, mm -hmm. the lid on it, that there weren't any actual artifacts. Is there a reason that archaeologists haven't been able to, to find evidence of those things? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, you, when you were talking about the Turkey, I thought that was fascinating because it was indicative of, of the incredible trade relations or the trade that was going on at that time. Are you aware of any uh, influences from the Mughal Empire here in the North America that would also verify that that trade existed? All right. Thank you. Those are really amazing questions. I don't know if I can even answer them. Okay. Um, the first question about why isn't there material evidence? So it is a little bit of a mystery, actually. Before the 15th century, um, if it's not a temple statue that's, a, that's in metal or stone, uh, there's almost nothing that has survived in terms of material uh, daily objects or small vessels and, and things from, from India. Th this is an uncomfortable, you know, this is why history writing is so difficult. I mean, there's some, obviously things existed, but they don't survive. For example, if you compared with China and the Middle East in the same period, you would have a tremendous record of porcelain, of um, metalwork. Uh, the 7th century, the 8th century, the 9th century, the 10th century, the 11th century, the 12th century, the 13th century, the 14th century. I mean, from the Islamic period only, you would have a non-stop record for all of those other, for China and for the Middle East. But for all of that, you have nothing in India apart from architecture, uh, the stone architecture, and, and temple statues in stone and metal, by and large. Now, there are a few exceptions. Um, in very ancient uh, arche digs of very ancient archaeological material, yes, you have things that were buried. You see, if they were buried, they were somehow saved. But if they were in the sort of daily items that may not have been buried, and probably the reason is there was tremendous reuse of materials, and there was also incomplete study. I mean, the scholarship hasn't yet, uh, you know, got, it's got questions to address. But that's why I find that like, writing history is not, not an even thing. You can't assume that everyone's got the same ingredients to tell the stories. For example, there are whole parts of the world, uh, there's a whole wooden architecture in parts of the world which doesn't survive. And so you think there's no history, but, but there is. You see, it's like an incomplete. So that's one thing. Um, and the, the answer is we don't know. Uh, that's why I find these Mughal paintings so interesting because you see forms, shapes, objects that simply don't survive in, in real life. Um, as to the second question, yeah, you had this incredible global trade. A lot of things were coming into the Mughal Empire, even from places like Scandinavia. You had walrus ivory, for example, that was coming in from Scandinavia. Now, was things going out? Yes, they were. And, uh, but in a slightly different way. I mean, the Europeans had come to the East from, from the time that Vasco da Gama opened up the trade routes to the East. The first people out of the door were the Portuguese. They set up the first world empire and they had a series of uh, establishments all across Africa and India. And what they wanted initially was spices, raw materials, the diamonds. So yes, all of these objects started slowly going across through the course of the 16th and 17th centuries. You then had also made products like textiles um, and uh, textiles and uh, inlaid furniture. Now, most of the stuff was going to Europe. The question about what was coming to America is really interesting. I, I can't honestly, and that's going to make me think about, I'm going to investigate that. See, South America, you had an exchange of gemstones because the emeralds were found in South America and they were coming to India. And I think what was going back was gold and maybe some spices. But North America at that time was still, uh, you know, the genocide hadn't, um, I'm sorry to put it that way, but hadn't really started the, the colonization or the, you know, there was still uh, Native American people 
in, and, and I don't think anyone has looked at what the relationship between Native American trade, global, was there global trade, um, or how did their world get touched, North Americans, uh, with, by India? I mean, there's, a, there's another weird, I just read a book my, that, that there was another kind of a strange trade, which was to do with ice. Um, you know that ice was traded across the world in ships that came from North America and the ice was taken all the way to Bengal and stuff in India. Um, I don't know what came back. That's a really good question. I think the ice started in North America, not South America. So okay, thank, thank you. you. You've given me something to think about. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, if you would go ahead and raise your hand or. Uh, so yeah. Navina, as you have delighted us with all these lovely objects, I thought I would share with you this. Oh, wow. You can see it. Oh, wonderful. And uh, maybe at some point we can talk about it, but it has all these lovely inscriptions. I do mm -hmm. have a translation. Okay. And good. I thought you would enjoy this. Very much so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it. Keshav, I told you this was not show and tell. I don't know why you're bringing up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Keshav, for your question. Anyone else? Jan also has a question. Can you unmute Jan? Do you know how to do that? Berenger? No, you're... I can't unmute you. I want to type your question in the chat and we'll ask it for you. No, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Excellent. All right. If there are no other questions, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I thought you talked about the ruby in the peacock throne. Mm -hmm. and I know I've actually been to the Red Fort where the peacock throne used to sit. Right. And told us that the Kohinoor diamond was and the peacock throne. Was were both of them there or is that some wrong information? Well, um, so it's interesting. I, the Kohinoor's history, I don't know it as well as that ruby. And, and I, the Kohinoor is a little bit harder to trace in the records than, than that ruby because the ruby has all the inscriptions on it. The Kohinoor, we know it primarily through its, again, its weight because there were many large diamonds around. Yes, the Kohinoor was very, very large. Um, and, but when it's mentioned, and we know for sure it was, it was that, that particular one, it's usually identified by its weight. Um, and I don't honestly know whether that was for sure in, in the peacock throne, but I wouldn't have been surprised, I mean, if it was, because all, many of the most important gemstones were put into the peacock throne. I think, it, I think there is an, an idea that it was in the peacock throne. Again, it's speculation, because the peacock throne itself doesn't exist, and its descriptions vary quite a lot in the original sources. So there is one scholar named Sue Strong, who's at the VNA, who's done a wonderful attempt to reconstruct everything that was in the peacock throne. So I, I will check again with her in, in her article. Um, but I don't have a definitive answer about whether the Kohinoor was in there or not. But thanks for asking it. That's the other big gemstone, the glamorous gemstone of the Mughal period, which again, no longer exists because it was later cut into three pieces. And now a smaller version of the Kohinoor is in the British royal crown. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Romy has a question. Romy, can you unmute yourself? She's shouting at me from downstairs. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So um, I know you, Navina, you had to pick 10 objects, I'm sure, out of so many. And so we saw a lot of, uh, you know, the decoration for the emperors. And I'm wondering if the women in the Mughal empire or in the court were as, you know, lavishly decorated mm -hmm. as the men or was it more, uh, you know, men wore more than women? Uh, so I, that's also really a good, good question. The women were very lavishly decorated, they were. But there wasn't the same, and there were many powerful Mughal women at court who we know a lot about, and their role has been explored in a lot of 
interesting history writing and, and also in original texts and original, and they appear in paintings. And so that's a sort of fascinating area. Um, but I think that the Mughal men also, I mean, they wore uh, as much jewelry as women, if not more. And a lot of the stones and gems that I showed you are really, the treasures are really to do with the authority that's vested in them. Yes. And that authority was in the world of the men. Now, not always. I am working for this, this exhibition that we're hoping to do at the Met is on the Jahangir period. And Jahangir's 18th wife, Noor Jahan, was a very a powerful woman with a tremendous amount of authority. And she actually um, uh, issued coinage in her name and, and she commissioned many important buildings. And in this, in the case of Noor Jahan, for example, one of the things we're aiming to do is to fill out the kind of visual record around Noor Jahan and see whether we can actually build up a good picture of how she looked, what she wore, what her world was like materially, and, and get a better idea on, on, you know, on what that was about. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the thank question. But thank you. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll keep the phone lines and the video uh, open for another 15 minutes so people can visit and ask additional questions. And in the meantime, just to be respectful of everybody's time, we will go ahead and wrap up this official part of our meeting, and mm -hmm. then uh, we'll stay on informally after this. Again, Naveena, thank you so much. The, <laughs> all the comments are talking about what a wonderful program this was, and I know that you're a rock star in the, <laughs> in the museum world, and, uh, and, and thank you so much for taking time to be with us today, and we really appreciate your parents joining us from India as well. This will be <laughs> a terrific family affair. I know. Thank you so much. Um, and can you save the comments and send them to me because I'd love to see I, I didn't get a chance to look at okay, all. I'll do that. I'm just copying them. I'm just going to copy them all and I will save them and send them on to you. Okay, good. Excellent. Well, uh, was, I will do that. Thank you. It was lovely to meet everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation and wishing everyone very well health and safety and uh, in the days ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Ranjit, uh, this is Cam here. Can sorry, I take Cam. a minute? I know, please, um, please, I know everybody. Please. Yeah. So, uh, Navina, uh, this is Cam Chandan. Uh, first of all, I told uh, this one hour has been extremely educational and informative. You'll see that comment, and uh, I cannot thank you enough for uh, sharing these kind of details. I don't know why you only limited to ten. I wish we could do hundred of these. Uh, <laughs> but I'm hoping. In, uh, you know, Ranjit is a close friend uh, in our district. In future, we would love to come and speak um, here in North Carolina. We will be happy to host you. Um, you. And, you know, these are details and information that is very, very hard to get until you start reading books. But you are, you are an amazing uh, encyclopedia by yourself. So thank oh, you. Well, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> That's very kind. That's really kind. Thank you. I really appreciate the, uh, you know, your your words and, and everybody's appreciation. It really means a lot because of course, one has a privilege of sharing one's uh, passion and interest and work with an interested audience. It's very meaningful for me. So thank you enormously. So thank, thanks. Right. Thank forward. you, Ranjit. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Not at all, not at all. And well, we do have to give the future this just governor the last word. So Kamlesh, happy that you, <laughs> thank you for taking that. <laughs> all right, and now-